At the age of 13 is when um, our whole family basically hit rock bottom of us being kicked out of our home. Um, and we had to sleep in a car with um, my other siblings and my mom. I realized at a young age that I didn't want that for my life. Um, it was a little too late because that moment I dropped out of high school because we didn't have a place or anything to go to. Or um, I, I think I was ashamed. I tried to do everything I could in my own power to help my mom, although I couldn't do much. And so that was being the emotional support for her. It was, it was really hard uh, just seeing her struggle and wanting to do more, but just no matter what she did, it felt like she just couldn't catch up with um, what she wanted to provide. At the age of 19 and 20, I decided to um, reach out for help, but that wasn't with people. Uh, it was actually with God. <laughs> My neighbor and I, we were bored one day, and she invited me to go to church with her and her family. And so me stepping into Central, it was overwhelming at first. I didn't know how to worship God. I didn't know what um, the pastor was even talking about, but there was a sense of me belonging as soon as I stepped in. And so I became a part of it and took the right steps to be a part of the Central family um, almost 10 years ago. So I got baptized the summer of 2012 um, and then jumped right into First Step and learning just about how to read the Bible and um, being a part of community and also serving the church and serving God. That's how I really became involved with uh, serving our youth and Central Youth Ministry or um, even with Hope for the City in our, um, when the pandemic happened, um, serving at the food pantries. It's because I was able to see families and kids who are in similar situations that um, I grew up in. I no longer can just sit in my own mess or my own um, shame or sadness that is connected to my past, but to um, help families and kids um, take steps in their journey as well, uh, to help them see a way out of their current situation. One of the most amazing things we get to do here at Central is our initiative called Hope for Kids. Hope for Kids is where we get to provide um, basic necessities for families who uh, wouldn't be able to receive those things if it was on their own. Um, so kids will be able to see a beautiful light experience while they drive through and receive basic necessities like um, a meal and toys for Christmas and um, just those things that their family or parents parents wouldn't be able to provide. One in six kids will go hungry this holiday season, and in the city that we live in, that is unacceptable. Would you consider jumping in and being a part of Hope for Kids this year by sponsoring a kid in need? With your help, we're going to give thousands of kids a Christmas they'll never forget. What an incredible story Shaniqua has. You know, what I take from that story is you never know what an act of generosity will do in someone's life. And that act of generosity in Shaniqua's life led to transformation where she's making a huge impact for the kingdom. You know, you and I get the privilege of doing that during this initiative called Hope for Kids. As Shaniqua just challenged all of us to prayerfully consider making a difference. In fact, our team told me yesterday that already through the Hope for Kids initiative, we sponsored now over 10,000 kids towards our goal of 30,000 kids being sponsored. Isn't that great, church? And I wanna encourage all of us, let's just keep it going. When I think of those 10,000, I'm so grateful and thankful for those being sponsored, but my heart is burdened for the 20,000 yet to be sponsored. And one of our challenges to us as a central family is for all of us to make our very first Christmas gift go to a child in need. It's easy to do. You can go to central.family. You can go to uh, centralonline.church. Or you can simply find one of our generosity team members wearing a red apron. You can give by credit or debit card. Or, or you can give by check or cash with our ushers at the end of the experience. But all of us can do our part. For some of us, we can sponsor a child at $50, or we can sponsor five, 10, 20, or even more. So I wanna challenge all of us to prayerfully consider what God would have us to do. And here's what I believe. If we listen to God, this problem will be solved. 
because God loves them and wants them to be cared for. Are you with me, church? That is his heart. And I know he's going to use us in that way. So I'm asking all of us just to open our hearts to God's leading as we prayerfully consider what he'd have us to do. Well, let's go to him in prayer. Will you join me? Well, Father, we're so grateful. We're honored, in fact, to just be here in your presence, to know that you're our God, that you love us unconditionally. God, that we have access to you, that you're available, and not just available, but that you want to be involved intimately in each of our lives. God, I pray for every relationship in this room with you. I pray that you would show up and that you would be intimately involved in the deepest, darkest needs of each person's life. And they would trust you and lean into you, knowing that you care for them, that you love them, that you desire to be in a relationship with them more than anything in this world. And God, that each person here would just open their hearts to you, to receive what you have for them, your love and your goodness and your grace and your mercy in their life today, Father. God, guide us with what you'd have us to do in response to the needs of our city. Help us not to just know those needs and walk away from them, but to listen to you and, and just take a step of faith, whatever you ask of us to do. And Jesus, right now, we just want to proclaim you and worship you and draw near to you. And Jesus, I pray right now that you would just put your arms of love and mercy around us as we lift your name on high. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe it. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Come on and declare that today Oh my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. You see that? I'm gonna see. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. someone's addiction, their sickness, their fear, their anxiety, and he's going to turn it into good. We just got to keep looking up and trusting in him. Come on, somebody. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. 
in the Bible is found in the book of Isaiah. It says, do you not know, have you not heard that the Lord is the everlasting God? He's the creator of all the universe. He never grows weak or weary. No one can fathom the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths and young men will fall in exhaustion. But listen up, those who hope and trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will walk and not be faint. They will run and not grow weary, yet they will soar high on wings like eagles. Listen, church, the victory is already in Jesus. We just got to keep looking up. He's going to help you soar through the difficulties you're going through. Just keep trusting in Him. I want to take a moment today. We want to pray for you. You're here today or watching online and you're struggling, you need God's help no matter what you're faced with. If I can just say a simple prayer for you today, would you just boldly slip your hand up in the air right where you're at? If you're next to somebody with their hand raised, if you're online next to somebody with their hand raised, stretch your hand out towards them. Let's just pray and ask God to do what only he can do. Would you join me? God, right now, we take our burdens, our pain, our difficulties, our sickness, our struggle, our anxiety, our fear, our addictions. God, we lay them all down before you. I pray in this very moment that you would meet us here and remind us, God, that the victory is already through your son, Jesus. I pray that today we would hang on to that truth, that we would continue to trust that you're gonna do the impossible in our lives, Lord. We love you and we thank you for who you are. For it's in your name we pray. And everybody said it together.
Bring your burdens, bring your pain, bring your worries, your hurt, bring your shame. We don't need them anymore, cause we are standing in the presence of the Lord. Every voice come in. God is in this house. God is in this house. And that's all that matters now. That's all that matters now. Be forgiven. Be restored. Find your healing, all you need and so much more. God is in this house, come on. God is in this house, and that's all that matters now. That's all that matters now. But God is in this house. God is in this and that's all that matters now And that's all that matters All that matters now today let fear give way to freedom come on and sing it out let fear give way to freedom let hurt give way to healing standing here on holy ground anything can happen now and in the name of jesus all death Pastor Jeb will be out in just a moment. You can be seen. Wow, that was a beautiful, beautiful time of worship. We want to thank you all so much for worshiping with us. We also want to welcome all of our central locations, especially that Sunrise Mountain location. Also, those of you who are watching online with your watch parties, thank you so much for joining us and for worshiping with us. That's right. And to the men and women watching in prison facilities through our partnership with God Behind Bars and the Pando app, we're glad that you're here. Absolutely. Now, no, no matter where you're watching from, right now, we want you to give it up big for our senior pastor, Pastor Judd Wilhite.
Good to see you guys today. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi. How many remember the hashtag from uh, several years ago on social media? The struggle is real. You remember this? Still around, but uh, it was really big a few, few years ago. And there's a lot of truth to that statement, right? The struggle is real. If you're parenting young kids right now, the struggle is real. I saw this on social media. I thought it was pretty funny. This person says, silence is golden, but when you have kids, silence is suspicious. <laughs> Come on, all you want if you've got little kids is just a moment of peace in your life. But the truth is, when you get that moment of peace, if they're not asleep, then you know something's up. Which, by the way, let me just say, church is a great place to come to get the moment of peace. Just saying. But if you bring your kids into the main room, well, you're missing out on that. So there you go. Uh, lots of opportunities for them. I saw this. Sometimes money can be uh, a struggle. This person says, my card was declined for ramen noodles. I was buying one bag. The cashier said, man, just take it. It's pretty bad when the cashier's like, I got you, bro. I'll just pay for this for you. All right, one more. This, uh, maybe some of you right now, you're feeling like school, the struggle is real. This person says, I just cleaned out my backpack. These are real words I turned in for a grade. Look at that. <laughs> person should be an attorney or a doctor or something. I don't know where you're at in life today, but, but if you're breathing, <laughs> I know the struggle is real. We all face different kinds of struggles in different seasons, but some of us are struggling right now just to keep going. Some of us are just kind of in an emotional funk, and the struggle is real. Some of you are wrestling with family dynamics. The struggle is real. If you are a Las Vegas Raiders fan, the struggle is real. If you're a Phillies fan and you've been watching the World Series, the struggle is real, right? Like, it just... So, you know, and by the way, if I get one more text on my phone telling me who to vote for in the upcoming election, I'm going to lose my mind. Anybody feel this? I'm like, just stop texting me already. You know, like the struggle is real. It's <laughs> vote for Jesus. I like that. The struggle is real, but here's the deal. In the midst of the struggle, we have an advocate, and we have a God who loves us. We've been in this teaching series called Jesus Loves. We've looked at how Jesus loves me in my mess, how he loves me in my pain, and, and today I want to talk to you about how Jesus loves me in my struggle. He loves me in my struggle, and I want to suggest to you that God not only can show up in the struggle, but he can show off in the struggle. He can show off in the struggle, and sometimes God does his best work in our lives when we're struggling. To give us an illustration of that, I want to look at its ma a famous miracle story in John chapter 9. And uh, John 9, Jesus is walking along. He's near the temple. His disciples, his crew is with him. And um, around the temple in, in the capital city of Jerusalem, there would have been like, there would have been people that were politicians. There would have been uh, elite religious teachers and leaders. There would have been everyday people. There would have been the poor, the lame, um, the sick, those who were begging because they really didn't have a social system in the ancient world. So they would go around the temple and and beg and depend on the charity of others. In John chapter 9, verse 1, it tells us this. I'm going to read this. When we get to the red word, say it real loud here with me. It's just how we make sure everybody's awake. It says, as Jesus was walking along, he what? He saw a man who had been blind from birth. He saw a man who had been blind from birth. And what strikes me as I just begin to read this story is that Jesus saw somebody who had never been able to see Jesus saw somebody who probably felt like they were alone in the darkness physically of their mind. He saw somebody who didn't realize that um, literally Jesus was coming along and was about to do a miracle in his life. And I have a word for somebody today because I know you got in the car, you came to church, you're watching online, you took that step in your life, but right now you're at a place where you feel so lonely, where the struggle is real and you just want to pull back. You want to close up the blinds because that's what we often want to do when we're struggling. It's so easy to look around and feel like nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I think that's a song there. Nobody knows 
all the stuff I have faced, right? And if they know, they don't care. Sometimes you can feel like God doesn't care. Sometimes you can feel like the church doesn't care, like people around you don't care. But here's my word for you today. Jesus saw a man who had been blind from birth. And the Bible tells us that God literally, the, the hairs of our head are numbered. Not even a, a sparrow falls to the ground outside of his knowledge. And I want you to know, wherever you're at today, even if you feel alone, I believe Jesus sees you. I believe he sees you. I believe God sees you. And he loves you. And he can help you in the midst of of the struggle. So I want to look with you today at three simple ideas, three things to avoid when the struggle is real. Three things to avoid when the struggle is real. Three don'ts, if you will. And the first one is simply this. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. I saw um, Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, there was a little meme of of him, uh, and it simply said this, if being overwhelmed made you lose weight, I'd be so thin right now. How many of you feel? It'd be the most amazing diet plan in the world, right? Being being overwhelmed, I'm all about that. But here's this guy, this man, born um, blind, and, you know, he would have certainly been overwhelmed in so many areas in his life. He would show up at the temple. More than likely, he would sit and depend on the charity of others. He would have to beg and depend on, you know, what they did for him. Um, and then on top of all of this stuff, he was born blind in a culture that often saw these kinds of physical disabilities as a form of divine punishment. And so the theological kind of God conversation around this individual would have been like, who sinned in their life that caused him to be born this way? And you see Jesus' disciples even engaging in this kind of conversation. They're walking along with him. Jesus sees this guy born um, blind. And here's what we read. John chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. Help me out when we get to the red word. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Look at this. Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins. So even Jesus' disciples feel like there's two options here, right? Either this guy sinned or his parents sinned really bad. And therefore, he's in this situation. But look at what Jesus says. It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the what? The power of God could be seen in him. Now, this is a word right here, this scripture, because it reminds us we need to be very careful about the assumptions that we make about someone else's suffering. We need to be very cautious about the assumptions that we kind of immediately make when somebody is struggling. Because it's easy to say, well, they're struggling because of this. Or I wonder what they did in their life. You go back to the book of Job in the Old Testament. And Job's this dude who everything goes bad for. All of a sudden, everything turns bad and rotten and kids die and he loses all his wealth and everything gets flipped upside down. And all Job's friends gather around and they're like, all right, Job, what'd you do? Right? Right? This is what the whole book's about. And they all take turns going through their questioning. And Job's like, I didn't do, I didn't do anything. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect, but, but you know, I didn't do anything. So they're like, come on, spill the tea, bro. Tell what'd you do, man? What'd you do? And you go through the whole book of Job again and again. It cycles through. What'd you do to deserve this? What did you do to cause this to happen to you? And you get later on in the book of Job and God shows up and he's got his, his words for Job, but he rebukes Job's friends. Because he's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes we assume because things happen in people's lives that somebody has done something to deserve it. And let me just suggest today that life is way too complicated and God is way too mysterious and the whole thing is way beyond our ability to comprehend. And maybe the attitude that we ought to take is believing the best about other people and realizing, I don't know why they're going through what they're going through, but I want to love them and encourage them and pray for them. And it may be me next. (laughs) right? It may be me next. So Jesus says, look, it wasn't his sins or his parents' sins that caused him to be in this situation. But he says, here's what can happen. The power of God can show up in the situation. And that's the thing about the struggle. If you're in a struggle right now, I don't know why you're in that struggle. I'm not sure why you're facing it, but I believe the power of God can show up in it. 
I remember years ago, this lady came down after one of our experiences, and um, she said, look, I, I work with somebody who's losing their sight. And some other co-workers are saying things like, this is because of somebody's sin or somebody's lack of faith that she's continuing to face this situation. She says, what do I, what do I say to her? And I was immediately able to go to, to John chapter 9, which we just looked at and be like, look, Jesus called this out in a very specific, uh, similar situation. And we talked about that a little bit. And then it just dawned on me, kind of like a Holy Spirit moment. And I realized this isn't about a co-worker or a friend. This is about her. And I just looked at her and I said, you're losing your sight, aren't you? And she said, yes, and uh, began to get emotional. And she said, the doctors tell me they've done everything they can do. And um, it's more than likely inevitable over the next several years, I will just continue to lose more and more of my sight and, until it's gone. And I was able to stand there and say, look, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I don't know why this is happening in your life. There's a lot that I don't understand, but here's what I believe I do know based on the word of God. I know that God loves you in the struggle. I know that God is with you in the difficulty. And I know that if you will lean into him and don't give up on him, he will do a miracle in your life as you follow him. Maybe it's the miracle of sight, and I pray that God would give her the miracle of sight. I said, or maybe it's another miracle that he gives you in your life as you follow him in faith. I don't know what God has planned, but I know in the midst of the struggle, our call is not to lean away from God, but to lean into him. And it was like our whole countenance changed. And that's my word for some of you today. Listen, the struggle doesn't mean that you're not seen. The struggle doesn't mean that you're somehow unloved. The struggle doesn't mean that God has thrown you on the scrap heap. It's not really about punishment. It's about God's power being released in your struggle. His power often shows up when you and I feel powerless. So don't give up on God. Don't give up on other people. Don't give up on the church. Don't give up on studying God's word. Don't give up on prayer. Don't give up on your community of friends. Don't give up just because it's hard. Don't give up just because it's difficult. Don't give up just because of how you feel in a moment. You got to put God's word over your feelings. You got to push back on that with your actions. You got to lean in and say, God, I'm going to trust you even though there's so much up in the air. Don't give up on God because he hasn't given up on you. So if you're in the struggle... If you're on the struggle bus, don't give up on God. Here's my second don't for you today. Don't look past your miracle. Don't look past your miracle. Now check it out. Jesus sees this guy born blind from birth. And immediately we, we kind of get this interesting story as he interacts with him. John chapter nine, beginning in verse six, it says, then he, Jesus, spit on the ground, made what? mud with saliva and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Everybody say, ooh, gross. Well, mud was like the duct tape of the ancient world. I, I, I mean, I grew up thinking duct tape could fix anything. I, I grew up in Texas, y'all. I don't know if anybody, I don't know how you grew up, but look, I remember my mom would tell me I get holes in my socks. No problem. You got any edge? Where's the duct tape? And I would just duct tape the socks. They're good. You know, duct tape can fix a lot of things, y'all. I still kind of feel this way today. I'm always looking for the duct tape. But in the ancient world, duct tape was, was mud. And mud could like hold things together. It could build whole houses out of thatch and mud and all of this. And it was also used in healing. And, and, and typically it would be mixed um, uh, with water and even saliva. This was an ancient way of sort of healing. From Even rabbis used this. And Jesus, in this moment, he, he spits in the ground. He makes some mud. He puts it over the man's eyes. And then let's bring that scripture back up and let's see what happens. Jesus puts the mud over the man's eyes. And uh, it says, he told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. So he gets this amazing miracle. But I want you to notice something, first of all. I mean, maybe this was implied. We don't know what may have happened around the conversation. But in the text, Jesus doesn't say, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam and you'll be able to see. He just tells him, look, you need to follow my word and do what I command and let let the results fall where they're going to fall. Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Okay. And so the guy does. And then he comes back seeing. Now, first thing I want to encourage you with is simply this. Jesus used everyday things to bring healing in this person's life. Mud and spit. 
everyday things. And God can use everyday things to bring healing and miracle, miracles into our lives as well. In fact, I want you to think about miracles for a moment here. And maybe it's helpful to just have some categories to sort of frame up how we think about them. Usually when we talk about a miracle, we think about what we might call spectacular miracles, right? Like, like this would be the Dallas Cowboys winning the Super Bowl. Spectacular miracle. Sorry. This would be the, things like the parting of the Red Sea. This would be things like, you know, walking on water, right? Somebody being raised from the dead, Lazarus in the Bible or others, people having miraculous healings, people get pinned under a car and suddenly are able to like lift the car up, move it out of the way. We hear the story, spectacular miracle. This is kind of what we tend to think like miracles are, right? If it's not spectacular, it doesn't count. Like if you're praying, God, do I ask her to marry me? Like, what do I do in this moment? And you look up to the sky and you're like, write it in the sky. Don't act like you've never done something like that in your life, right? Come on, God, just... Just write it in the sky. And what you're looking for is like big, bold, cursive letters, you know, do it. <laughs> spectacular miracles. I believe God can do spectacular miracles today. I don't believe the miracle like faucet was turned off, you know, like the Bible was finished and then no more miracles, right? I, I believe God can do miracles of healing. I believe he can do supernatural things in our lives. I pray regularly that God will move in such a way that it's undeniable that it's him who does things in our lives. If you come to me and you're sick, I'm going to pray that God will do a supernatural miracle of healing in your life. So people are always like, God, I just pray that you do your will. Well, yeah, that's a given, but I'm going to pray that you get healed and God can do what he wants. Okay. Spectacular miracles. But sometimes we don't, we don't always get the spectacular miracle we're praying for. God can also work in a whole other category, which would be like everyday miracles. Simple mud and spit. Simple ways. God can work through people. Like maybe you want to make a change in your life right now, and you're praying that God will take certain inclinations away from you, that he will change your heart. He'll help you deal with a hurt or a habit or a hang up in your life. And God may do that supernaturally. He may take all of that away and just change you in a moment, and I believe he can. But just as often, or maybe even more often, God could work in your life through what we might call everyday miracles. That change may come not in a spectacular moment, but through everyday commitment. Getting involved in a community like like we have at Central across our locations called Celebrate Recovery. Getting some accountability. Getting some accountability in your life. Having people pray for you and encourage you. And over time, the miracle may come, but it may not be this spectacular in a moment miracle. It may be a process, but it's still a miracle. Listen, maybe you, you, you're in a place where you discover you've, you've got cancer or medical emergency in your life. And, and man, I'll pray with you that God heals that spectacularly in your life. And, and I believe he can, but sometimes he doesn't. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't go to the doctor. Hello. And go through chemo if that's what's prescribed. And you start taking those steps and you may find that you get your miracle through everyday means. I would suggest it's still a miracle that God's still moving and working. And there's another miracle category that we don't talk about enough, which is unexpected miracles. Of course, they're all unexpected, maybe at some level if they're a miracle. But what I mean is, like sometimes there's the, there's the miracle we're praying for and there's the miracle we experience. Yesterday, I was talking to a friend of mine here at Central and, and he had gone through a struggle with cancer and we were talking about this friend who called him and um, she had also gone through a struggle with cancer and she asked him this question. She said, if you could go back and take all the cancer away and all that you went through with all of that and never have had to face cancer, would you do it? And he said, no. And she said, neither would I. Because what they found is that while they prayed for one kind of miracle, God actually gave them an unexpected miracle, a new perspective on life, a new perspective on other people, a new appreciation for every day as a gift, a new appreciation for what's important in life. Like, sometimes the miracle God does in you is greater than the miracle that he may do for you. Right? Sometimes the work that he does in you is the most important work, and sometimes the miracle is an unexpected miracle. You know, I think sometimes when we're struggling, we're praying that God will deal with one specific situation, and the temptation is to look past all the other ways that he's working in our lives. When you think about it, just getting up in the morning is a miracle. Just being able to face another day is a miracle. 
just having the strength to go forward in the things that God has put before us, it's a miracle. And sometimes we can miss the greater miracles that God's doing as we pray for one specific thing in our life. Don't look past your miracle. In fact, I, I like this miracle in the Bible in John 9 because it fits a category that I often call like slow motion miracles. You know, like Jesus tells him, go wash um, in the, the like Siloam, uh, the pool of Siloam, and then immediately he's able to see. But he has to make that journey. He has to follow through with what God told him to do before the miracle happens. Sometimes the miracles happen along the way as we're following God. Like you may be in a situation with a guy or a girl that you're dating and you may feel like we need a miracle. Come on, somebody. We need a miracle. And you can say, look, I'm gonna, I, I need a miracle, but I'm going to keep loving. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep setting healthy boundaries. And the miracle eventually happens along the way. It's almost like a slow motion miracle. Uh, you may say, I need a miracle in my finances. You know what I'm talking about. God needs you to show up in the, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to work hard and you're not going to keep track of your money and you're not going to honor God with what he's given you. And you're not going to try to lower your expenses and raise your contentment level. And what you might find is that while you're praying for a miracle, the miracle actually happens along the way while you're doing the things God has already laid out for you to do in your life. Listen, God can empower you with his spirit along the way. He can give you a sense of purpose along the way. He can be peace into your home along the way. He can restore your relationships with your parents or with your kids along the way. He can develop your gifts and fill you with joy along the way. He can heal you, give you self-control, make you stronger, give you wisdom, help you financially. He can bring forgiveness into your life and he can do it all along the way. And so don't look past the miracle of every day. And while you may be praying for one miracle, follow God along the way. And you may find the miracle happens on the journey. Here's another thought. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't keep it to yourself. So in John 9, he washes in the pool of Siloam, and then he's able to see. It's amazing. It's a miracle. He's never seen before. Can you imagine that moment? What it, how overwhelming that must be to see for the very first time. And so the... Um, he starts to tell people about what's happened. He tells them like, I don't know, man, this guy, Jesus, you know, he told me to do it. He put mud on my eyes. I go, I get in the pool, I'm healed. And so the word starts to spread. People that knew this guy and had seen him for years, they're like, oh my gosh, it's a miracle. He can see. And then the religious leaders hear about it and they get all dialed in and they really weren't on team Jesus already. Okay. So they're sort of like, this can't be, something's wrong. So they bring the guy in and they start to harass him. Now here's these wealthy, educated religious leaders and political leaders. And, um, and then here's this guy who had been born blind. You got to assume probably wasn't educated, probably didn't have very much of anything. And they're grilling him. Who is this person? Who is Jesus? We know he's a sinner. They're like asking him all these questions. They even bring the blind guy's parents in and they start interviewing them and grilling them because they're like, was he really born blind? Was it this, you know, like what's really going on? They're trying to get to the bottom of it, right? And it's great because the, this guy's response in the moment is profound because he can't argue with them theologically. And he really doesn't have an ability to go like toe to toe with them about all the nuances of the Bible or what you believe about this. He doesn't know any of that stuff. He's just a guy. But look at what he says in the moment. John chapter 9, verse 25. This sort of shuts the conversation down. He says, I know this. I was blind. <laughs> and now I can what? See. He's like, I, I don't know. I don't know if he was a sinner. I don't know who the guy is. Like, I don't know. But I can tell you this. I was blind. And now I can see. Have you ever thought about the fact that the most powerful thing that you can share when it comes to your faith is simply your story of what God has done in your life. I, I read some statistics that the majority of Christians really struggle to share their faith, even if they want to, with other people. And that many of them don't ever share their faith. Some, some people can go their whole life and believe they should share their faith, but they just never do. 
And I think sometimes we make it too complicated in our minds. We think, I got to know the five scriptures. I got to tell people like, you know, there's this scripture and that scripture. You got to do this step and that step and this step. We got to like have the whole, all these things like figured out, or we got to know all the answers or like we have to live the perfect life. Like, like if you watched me watch my team play on the, you would never listen to me talk about God again with that kind of thinking, you know, like whatever it might be, right? You just think I got to have a perfect life to... And I just think we make it way too complicated because this is really all you need to share your faith. I was blind, but now I can see. Like, I was struggling, but this is what God did in my life. I felt lonely and I prayed and God began to stir something in my life and I got connected to a church community and it really started to make a difference. I mean. It's that simple. Just because here's the thing. People can argue with you about ideas. They can argue with you about what to believe and what not to believe. But it's really hard to argue with somebody's experience. I was blind, but now I can see. And that testimony has power. Nobody wishes to go through a struggle. But one day the struggle you're in will be your story. One day the trouble will be your testimony. So this week, I asked people on social media to finish this sentence. I believed Jesus was real when? And I just asked people to kind of put in their responses and they were very moving. People said things like this. I believe Jesus was real when he saved my marriage. I believe Jesus was real when he got my mom off drugs and restored our relationship. I believe Jesus was real when he gave me strength and guidance to pull myself out of a pit of despair. I believe Jesus was real when he removed my obsession with alcohol or when he made it impossible to lose custody of my kids or when I was in the hospital with cancer and I felt this immediate sense of calm and peace, when he blessed me with a child, when he got me out of my mess, when I finally had a group of real friends, when he rescued me from heartbreak break and showed me love when I felt unworthy of it. Friends, if you think about it, you have your story. You have your story. You have your moment where you could look back and say, you know what? I I was blind, but now I can see. If you're in the struggle right now, there are people in this room who are, in fact, this room is filled with people who have gone through what you're going through. I know it's easy in that moment to feel like you're all alone. I know when you're struggling, you can feel like nobody knows the pain that you feel. But I want you to know you're around people and somebody in this room has gone through some variation of what you're going through. And God has pulled them through. There are people who can say, I was once blind to God's love or to my own value and purpose, but now I see. I was once lost in my own mess but now I am found. I was once lonely, but now I found some community. I was once addicted, but now I found some freedom. I was once drowning in debt, but now I can be generous to others. I was once anxious, but now I have found a sense of peace. I was once in the darkness of despair, but now I have the light of hope. I once used to be angry, but now I have more joy and compassion. I once felt unworthy, but now in my life I feel valued and loved. I used to be far from God and now I am called a friend of God. I was blind, but now I can see. So if you're in the struggle, don't give up on God. And then don't look past the miracles he's given you every day. And then don't keep it to yourself. Share with others what God's done in your life. You don't have to make it too complicated. You do not have to make it weird. You just talk about what God's done in your life. It's as simple as that. And God can use that moment. He can use it powerfully. In fact, it's often more powerful for your friends who aren't connected to God, who maybe don't really have faith, who don't go to church, they're not involved, for them to hear what God has done in your life than for them to ever hear me give a message. It will be more powerful for them to just practically and authentically hear what God has done in your life. Jesus loves you, even in the struggle. 
And God can not only show up in the struggle, he can show off in the struggle. So don't give up. Don't look past what he's doing every day and don't keep it to yourself. In fact, you ever thought about this? Sometimes when you need a miracle the most, that's precisely when God's calling you to be the miracle for somebody else. Sharing your faith can help you be the miracle for somebody else. Supporting some kids through our Hope for Kids initiative can help you be a part of the miracle for somebody else. Forgiving somebody in your life, loving somebody, doing an act of kindness can be you being the miracle for somebody else. And you might find that was the unexpected miracle all along that was more important than the miracle that you were praying for. So if you're here today and you've never crossed the line of faith, I'd love to give you that opportunity. I'd love to just invite you to reach out to God and ask him to move and work in your life. I believe he sees you today and I believe he loves you. So I wanna ask everybody, will you bow your heads and close your eyes? If you'd like to take that step of faith, you can begin by repeating a simple prayer after me. You could say this either out loud or just in your own heart and mind. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life and help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you in Christ's name. Friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer today, I wanna to ask you to just slip your hand in the air just make eye contact with me just to say before God and to say to me, you're going to follow him and trust him in your life today. God bless you guys. Hands going up around the room. Thank you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you. Let's reach out to him today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, we love you. I thank you for each person just reaching out to you today. I pray you'll show up in their life in a powerful way. Fill them with your peace, your kindness, your goodness, your forgiveness, your mercy. And walk with all of us in the midst of the struggle. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual commitments in their life today. I'm going to ask you to remain seated for just a moment. I want to say congratulations if you made a spiritual commitment. I want to encourage you to go to the uh, lobby area, to our next step area after service. We'd love to uh, just let them know you made a spiritual commitment. We'd love to give you a journal. It's called the Follow Him Journal. It'd be a powerful tool for you. You can also go to central.family and click the link, I've decided to follow Jesus, and we could get that to you electronically as well. Well, would all of you stand together with me? And as you do, let's put our hands together for Pastor Nick, who's got a few closing thoughts. Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for that incredible message of hope. And if you prayed that prayer today, first of all, we want to congratulate you for making the best decision you could have ever made. But I want you to go to central.family, click on the button that says, I decided to follow Jesus. And we're going to send you some resources to help you along in your journey. Absolutely. And we would love to stay connected with you throughout the week. There are ways that you can connect with us. We are actually on the YouVersion Bible app as of this week. You can go to the YouVersion Bible app search for Central Church, look for our logo, and set online as your church location. You can stay connected in community with us there. You can also shoot me a text at 702-919-4277. I would love to just reach out to you and pray for you and, and just to get to know you a little bit better. Also, listen, you don't just have to experience the weekend on the weekend. You can, you can experience it throughout the week. Go to Spotify, podcast, uh, wherever we are, you can listen, like, and share those experiences with your friends and family. Indeed, no, there are so many ways to stay connected with the Central Family. Now, family, before you go, we want you to hang on to Romans 8 that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up. <laughs>